Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Lee Randall, and I will be asking the questions here. <laughs> um, Kate will do a bit of reading, we'll have a chat, <clears throat> there'll be a chance for you to ask some questions, and of course, afterwards, there'll be a signing in the next door area, um, just form an orderly queue. Um, I think that's, that's all the business. Oh, phones either on silent or off. Um, and if you're going to text about, uh, tweet about the event, it's wonderful, you're having the best time of your life, and we're the two smartest women you've ever met. <laughs> right? So, I'm here with Kate Atkinson, whose fiction is intelligent, playful, heartbreaking, and so funny. It bends time, it weaves together diverse characters, and almost always involves dualities, notably where family and identity are concerned. Um, if you read her British Council entry under the critical analysis bit, it says... Oh, I've never read that. Well, I'm gonna <laughs> read I'm gonna read it to you, Kate. <laughs> <coughs> it says, she is the most games-playing of writers, playing with literary genre conventions, eroding their boundaries, and entertainingly subverting them. I, my feeling is that Kate not only tells us a story, but also shows us how the mechanism works. It shows us how the story is being put together, or in fact, how it might be put together in an alternate form. Um, her debut behind the scenes at the museum won the Whitbread Prize. That turned into the Costa Prize, and she went on and won it twice more for Life After Life and A Garden Ruins. <clears throat> in 2004, the world met Jackson Brody. Ooh, the who. Policeman turned P.I. I was just saying how exciting it would have been if, say, Jason had been in Edinburgh today and we could have brought him <laughs> along and he would just have done this whole event. Yeah. <laughs> and we could have just sat back. <laughs> sat back. Sat back. Um, so, Policeman turned P.I., a man with a sad, tragedy-filled past. Now, that first novel, Case Histories, won the Salt Iron Award and the pre-Westminster. And Stephen King said, not just the best novel I've read this year, but the best mystery of the decade. He came back in one good turn, when will there be good news, and started early, took my dog, and eventually arrived on television in the form of lovely Jason Isaacs. And he's back in the number one best-selling Big Sky. Um, and since the Brody novels are always about what's happening now, it's not surprising this is a novel that has everything from human trafficking to blended families to the messed up state of the UK, loss, adversity, damage, depravity, and courage. So let's give Kay another big welcome. Thank you. Do you, want, do you want to set us up with a reading? I haven't told them too much about the story because with a, when there's a mystery at the heart of something, I don't want to give too much away. Okay. I, I must apologize because once I've finished a book, it leaves my brain and I have trouble even remembering characters' names. People think it's hilarious, but there isn't room. <laughs> I've not read from this book. I've not talked about this. I've not done an event. I didn't do a tour for this book, so I haven't done any events. So it's my only event and my only reading. So. Uh, there's uh, multiple storylines, multiple characters. Um, the passage I'm going to read is quite short. This is about Vince. Can't remember his surname. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the breakdown of his marriage. He is uh, Vince is one of the more innocent characters in the book. There are basically there's good people and there's bad people in this book, and Vince is a good character, but also. Sad character, who I think is okay in the end, but this is his marriage breaking down. I had a lot of trouble finding a passage to read, actually. I was going to read Jackson, but there was nothing that I could really fill it out of him. And I've not read this before. Vince was grinding towards 50. For the last three months, he'd been living in a one-bedroom flat behind a fish and chip shop. Ever since his wife, Wendy, turned to him one morning over his breakfast muesli, he'd been on a short-lived health kick, and said, hey, enough's enough, don't you think, Vince? Leaving him slack-mouthed with astonishment over his Tesco finest berry and cherry. 
their daughter, Ashley, had just set off on her gap year, backpacking around Southeast Asia with her surfer boyfriend. As far as Vince could tell, gap year meant that there was a lull between him funding her expensive private school and funding her expensive university, a remission that was nonetheless still costing him her airfares and a monthly allowance. When Vince was young, he'd been taught the worthy non-conformist virtues of self-discipline and self-improvement, whereas Ashley, not to mention the surfer boyfriend, simply believed in the self-it. Not that he was resentful. He loved her. As soon as Ashley had fledged on an Emirates flight to Hanoi, Wendy reported to Vince that their marriage was dead. Its corpse wasn't even cold before she was internet dating like a rabbit on speed, <laughs> leaving him to dine off fish and chips most nights and wonder where it all went wrong. Tenerife, three years ago, apparently. I got you some cardboard boxes from Costco if you'd put your stuff in, she said, as he stared uncomprehendingly at her. Don't forget to clear out your dirty clothes from the basket in the utility room. I'm not doing any more laundry for you, Vince. 21 years a slave, it's enough. This, then, was the return on sacrifice. You worked all the hours God gave, driving hundreds of miles a week in your company car, hardly any time for yourself, so your daughter could take endless selfies in Angkor Wat or wherever, and your wife could report that for the last year she'd been sneaking around with a local cafe owner, who was also one of the lifeboat crew, which seemed to sanction the liaison in her eyes. <laughs> Craig risks his life every time he goes out on a shout, she said. Do you, Vince? <laughs> well, yes, in his own way. It clipped at your soul. Wendy enjoyed shaving and shearing, slicing and strimming. She had the fly mower out on the lawn almost every night in summer. Over the years, she spent more time with the lawnmower than she had with Vince. And she may as well have had secateurs for hands. One of Wendy's weird hobbies was growing a bonsai tree, or stopping it growing, been supposed, a cruel pastime that reminded him of those Chinese women who used to bind their feet. That was what she was doing to him now, snipping at his soul, trimming him down to a dwarf version of himself. Vince had still been in the signals when he met Wendy at an army mate's wedding down south. He had a Balkan suntan and newly promoted sergeant stripes, and she'd giggled and said, oh, I do like a man in a uniform. And two years later, they were at their own wedding, and he was on Civvy Street working for a telecoms firm, first as an engineer running the IT before moving into the suit and tie end of the business in management. He thought of Craig, the lifeboatman, and wondered now if it had been the uniform all along that she liked about Vince and not the man inside it. He had trudged through his life for his wife and daughter more heroically than they could imagine, and this was the thanks he received. Couldn't be a coincidence that trudge ran with drudge. He had presumed that there was a goal to be reached at the end of all the trudging, but it turned out that there was nothing, just more trudging. This'll do, they had called their house. A jokey idea that seemed stupid now, but they'd been a jokey kind of family once. A unit that functioned at the top of its game. Barbecues in the back garden, friends round for drinks, trips to Alton Towers, foreign holidays at four-star resorts, a cruise or two. Living the dream compared to a lot of people the dream of a middle-aged, middle-of-the-road, middle-class man. They had loaded up the boot every weekend at Tesco's, never stinted treating Ashley to dance classes, horse riding, birthday parties, tennis lessons, school skiing trips. You needed a second mortgage for them. And the wear and tear on his time, ferrying her to sleepovers and play dates. She didn't come cheap. Not that he was resentful. He loved her. <laughs> and driving lessons. Hours, days even of his life that he would never get back, teaching them both his wife and daughter to drive, sitting in the passenger seat of his own car with one of them in the driving seat, neither of whom could tell left from right or even backwards from forwards. And then suddenly Ashley was on the back of a tuk-tuk and Wendy had a Honda with a UKIP sticker on the back that she zipped around in looking for the new Mr. Right, now that Vince was suddenly Mr. Wrong. Craig, the lifeboatman, had been jettisoned, apparently, in favour of the smorgasbord of Tinder. Apparently, Vince could have had a whole Mr. Men series of his own. Mr. Boring, Mr. Overweight, Mr. Exhausted. <laughs> This'll do, he snorted to himself. No, it didn't do at all, and even Sparky treated him like a stranger. Sparky was an indeterminate kind of lurcher that had chosen well Wendy as its alpha male, even though Vince was inordinately fond of it and was the one who'd usually taken it for walks or cleaned up its crap or fed it expensive food, which in retrospect seemed of a higher quality than the tins of supermarket own brand stew he'd been reduced to buying nowadays when he wasn't dining on fish and chips. 
He should probably just buy dog food for himself instead of a stew. It couldn't be worse. He missed the dog more than he missed Wendy. In fact, he was surprised to find that he hardly missed Wendy at all, just the home comfort she'd taken away from him. A man bereft of his home comforts was just a sad and lonely bastard. <laughs> you again, the jolly bustling woman behind the chip shop counter said to him every time he came in. He could probably have reached out his back window and into the chip shop and scooped the fish out of the fryer himself. Yes, me again, Vin said without fail, brightly, as if it was a surprise to him too. It was like that film, Groundhog Day, except he didn't learn anything because, let's face it, there was nothing to learn and nothing ever changed. One of each, please, he said to the woman in the chip shop. Was there anything more wretched than about to be divorced a middle-aged man ordering a single fish supper? Do you want scraps with that, the woman asked. If you've got them, please, thank you, he said, grimacing inwardly. Yes, he was not blind to the irony of her question, he thought, as the woman shoveled up the crispy remnants of batter. That was all that was left of his life now, scraps. More, she asked, the scoop still poised, prepared to be generous. The kindness of strangers, he thought. He should learn her name. He saw more of her than he did anyone else. No thanks, that'll do. Thank you. <laughs> um, Wendy comes to a terrible end. I know you said that your your book fin your relationship finishes at the end of the book, but we're going to talk about the themes and the characters. That's anyway. okay. <laughs> you know, it's what we're That's here why for. That's we're here. <laughs> um, so I've read that the genesis for this wasn't as a Brody book at all, but it was as a screenplay for Victoria Wood. Well, it was a. I began a spec screenplay for Victoria Wood because she had been in, started early, took my dog, and I thought Victoria Wood was a wonderful actress who simply wasn't used enough in her acting role, and I thought I wanted to write something about a middle-aged, or even older, really, female detective on the point of retiring and set it on the East Coast, and so I had her in mind, and she had no idea, and, and then, very sadly, she died when I hadn't really got very far with it, and I put it to one side, but because it had been an idea that had been rattling around in my brain for longer than that, I thought oh, that will eventually get resuscitated. And it seemed an ideal ve vehicle for Jackson because it was in Yorkshire and he needs to keep going back there. And which bits of, so which was it the... the oh, hardly the anything <laughs> remains, I'd <have to> say. <laughs> uh, um, it was, I think the trafficking was the, was the one thing that remained. But it, when I was writing it, it was, I wanted to set something on the east coast of Yorkshire because it's somewhere I'm very familiar with and because it's, I thought, oh, that would be stunning visually when I was thinking of a television mm -hmm. programme. Yes, and so it's, um, it's quite a filmic book in some ways. It's quite a visual book. Yeah. But I didn't really use that scenery. I was thinking that today. I was thinking I could have used more scenery and instead it just becomes the sort of the, the back side of the seaside in a way. Although I was speaking to somebody earlier today who is very familiar with Scarborough and said that she could visualize every single step <laughs> anyone took and sh you know that it's that accurate. Yeah. I think um, a lot of the book is set in a sort of hinterland between Scarborough and Whitby because I didn't want to be entirely offensive to the people of Scarborough uh, and and a, a lot of people seem to think it's entirely set in Whitby, which is, is strange. As there are scenes in Whitby, but I think a lot of reviews have sort of said, oh, the, you know, the, de the decline of the seaside town, uh, you know, and I think there is a decline because people are not going there anymore, but there's also an extreme vibrancy. I'm certainly not Whitby. I mean, Whitby has is, 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 um, managed to stay incredibly alive because it's addressed lots of niche audiences like goths. And last time I was there a few weeks ago, the pirates were in town. <laughs> and I, know, I think in a way it's very interesting the way that that appeals to people's fantasies and allows people to have fantasy lives. Because you see things in Whitby and, and you don't even comment on them, whereas if you saw them in your own street, you would think, mm. God, what you why is that man carrying a sword and wearing a hat with a feather in it? So I think that was it's quite interesting. But I think you know, the, the, the decline of those towns is, is natural in the same way that, you know, the industrial towns of the north are necessary in decline because we just don't have, you know, it's, it's not, people are no longer going to go to Scarborough for a glamorous holiday in the Royal Hotel. It's, there's no yeah. way around that. And there's a big problem with, you know, with drugs and, in these towns. 
Um, you mentioned television, and one of the things I read was that you, you talked about wanting to reclaim Brody from the television Brody, make him, bring him back to you. And, and I gather, well, unless I misread that, and, and that it had to do with language, that because l p television has a kind of poverty of, a linguistic poverty that... Oh, oh yeah, I see, because you can't go inside his head in television, that's yeah. true, and most of, the, most of my writing takes place inside characters' heads, so it's always going to be, there's going to be a paucity of language once you start um, doing that. And I thought it was because of the way he spoke, because I had a big argument with Jason, not a big argument, a little argument with Jason about his accent, because I, I taped my cousin, and I said, this is what he sounds like, he's like posh Yorkshire that's educated himself out of the North to a certain extent, and he went with his own generic Northern. <laughs> 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 so, no, it, it was more to do with, well, I'd, I'd got worn out with writing those books, because I did four in a row, and then he got a face, because he got Jason's face, so I, I never, ever know what characters look like. I never have facial features. I never describe people's faces. I might get as far as their hair or their clothes, mm. but very, very rarely. You know, so I don't know what Jackson looks like. So your big sky Jackson doesn't look like Jason Isaacs now? No, he's gone back to looking like nobody. I mean, honestly, I never, it, it, there's no visualization when I'm writing that I don't think about what color his hair might be, how tall he is. I, don't, I have no idea what Jackson looks like. Isn't that amazing? Because it's all inside his head. Yeah. No, I, s I have that with a lot of characters in books. I couldn't mm. tell you what they look like, mm. but I could tell you who they were, mm. you know, because mm. I've been in, inside mm. their hearts. Mm. I mean, one of the things, that I love about Jackson is he's never alone even when he's alone because he's always got, he does a running commentary and it is what he imagines various ex-partners would have, what cheeky remarks they'd be making, but it's obviously his own. I never can tell the id from the ego or the, but you know, it's something inside him that's bubbling up. He's always critiquing himself. Yes. It's like he can't leave himself alone. I think of those, both as being real, though. I think of Julia actually <laughs> being <laughs> inside his head. <laughs> but there is that element of self-awareness in him, which is, is, is very ongoing all the time, I think. Yeah, he does, he does criticize himself. So I'm always curious what makes, what draws a writer back to a character or characters, because we'll talk about Reggie a little bit. Um, and is it because because Jackson can tell a particular kind of story for you? I mean, is he, is he just the best tool for the job? And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. <laughs> um, or is it that when you're working on something else, Jackson pops up and says, so okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think, I think of him as a really useful thread and also a structure, it's sort of two opposite things, but he's a way of manipulating a plot. I think, so that he's, because I don't need to think about him, I can concentrate on the other elements in, in the books he's in, I think, so, because you, you, if you want to bring a large cast of characters together, you have to have a means, they can't, you know, they could all be working at a bank, or they could all meet each other randomly, or whatever, but it's, he is the, the very useful tool to, to bring them all together and make sense of them, I think. So I'm never really that focused on him, because I know he's just going to do his thing. His thing. Well, his thing, um, he's so, he's got this, um, he's got that savior thing. I think of him sometimes, please don't be offended, as a Labrador. I think of him more as a German chef. Ah, okay. I thought the dog <laughs> part would bother you. I wasn't no, so worried about the <laughs> Because he sees trouble and he's like, he doesn't think, he just goes, must save, yeah. must help. Yeah, no, he says it's very instinctive in him. No, I always think of him as a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got all the good qualities of a dog. I yeah, think, yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's loyal and, and his instinct is to pull you out of the river or the burning building, which I think a German Shepherd is more likely to do than a Labrador. <laughs> <laughs> if I, you know your dogs. <laughs> I, you know, okay. Okay, you know, I'll go with that. I'm, as, I'm so happy you're not offended by the dog analogy. <laughs> Um, he, yeah, he does, because you say that um, also, how on earth has Jackson retained his, his optimism about humanity? Do you think he's optimistic? I don't think he's very Well, you say inside him there remained a belief, a small, buttered, and buried relief 
that his, it must be battered, that must be a typo on my part, battered, <laughs> it wouldn't be a buttered, buttered I apologize, <laughs> um, that his job was to help people be good rather than to punish them for being bad. Well, that's a small belief that remains, I think, but, but no, but that's different from being a pessimist in a way, isn't it? That's part of his dog-like desire to help, I think. I think he's fairly pessimistic. Okay. You know, you know who I found really optimistic? And so here we have the bad men who are trafficking women from around the world. Um, but you've got these two lovely young male characters. You've got um, Jackson's son, and you've got Crystal. I love Crystal. Mm. Crystal's son, Harry. Harry. And they both seem like the kind of lovely, I'm going to ask you to describe them a wee bit if you can remember. <laughs> um, they seem like the kind of young men that really do promise hope for the future. I'm not and so they sure seem that. like a counterweight mm. for the... Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, Nathan is only 14, Jackson's son, so he's fairly unformed. So he's at the height of his adolescent... Mm. And, and um, so I think he's not... We will yet to see what will happen to Nathan. Um, and I, I asked my grandson, who's 15, I asked him lots of questions and I, I, I studied him. He gets, a, he gets a thanks at the beginning of the book just for being a 14-year-old boy at the time. But he's not, it's not as quite, quite as inarticulate as Nathan. So Nathan, I don't know, he's like put to one side. What will happen to Nathan? Um, but Harry, I think, is, is... I think Harry is very like Reggie was when she was 16, which is, is both knowing and clever but also very naive and innocent. So I think it's, there's something lovely about that combination. He's, he's very young for his age as well, so I mean, he's more like a 12-year-old in some ways, I think, but in other ways he's an old man. So. But you've given him a great stepmother. Crystal, yes, yeah. she is one of my favourite characters. Can you talk a little bit about She her? is. I love her to bits. Crystal's had a terrible abusive childhood, like one of the worst awful childhoods, and she's clawed her way out of it, literally, um, because she was running a nail bar when she meets Tommy, who's one of the bad people, and um, she becomes his trophy wife, his second wife. We don't really, we're not entirely sure what happened to his first wife. And um, she is a very artificial creation. She's got false hair, false nails, false everything. And um, at the same time, she is an, she's an Amazonian. She is the real heroic character in this book, I think, and she, because her ferocity comes from her desire to protect her children, so she, she kind of stalks through the book. She has got no time for Jackson whatsoever. She regards him as an absolute idiot, um, and, and, and quite rightly in many ways, I think. So he, he knows that he can't save her, that she is going to be the one who is ultimately going to save who she needs to save. She's very ruthless, very ruthless. Yes, but I liked, I liked the way you subverted our, you know, there she was, the trophy wife, every, and then you turn it, which is what you always do. You take it and you turn it and say, actually, there's more to this person. Oh, I always knew she was going to be that person, yes. I always knew she was going to end up, you know, ripping out her false hair and taking out her false nails. <laughs> and Taking yeah, charge. Taking charge, yeah. Um, and you brought back Reggie. I also brought back Tatiana, can I say? Can I tell you she's my other favorite yeah, character? Yeah, I love Tatiana. I always yeah. knew that there was room for the Russian to come back. Yeah, she's fabulous. I, Im I imagined that Tatiana is from Wonkutcher, and she goes off at the end with Gloria, who is my great middle-aged woman heroine of all time. And I always envisaged that they would be become vigilantes as the most of bizarre combination of people that, that, that could be possible. This Russian, well, she was, no, she was never a prostitute. She was uh, more of a, a dominatrix. And, uh, and Gloria, this kind of well-upholstered middle-aged woman, I thought they would be off punishing people, <laughs> mainly men, actually, I think, but just gen generally. just. But they didn't, they haven't yet. Tatiana's plowed her own furrow. Yes, she gets up to some fabulous things. And yes. I just, every time she's around, I'm like, yeah, come back, come sit by me. Let's have a oh drink. No, she's very scary. I wouldn't want her sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Reggie. And Reggie. Well, Reggie's a very popular character, and people often ask me, are you going to bring Reggie back? And for years, I, Reggie is 16, 
and that was what Reggie was. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine Reggie being older because I couldn't see what would happen to all of that vibrancy that she had, but how that would pan out for her in later life. And then, uh, and then uh, I had a kind of a, it all made sense that Reggie would become a policeman or a policewoman or whatever we call police now. Um, so she's a detective now because she would always follow very reluctantly in Jackson's footsteps, I think. And also because she is very much a crusader. If Jackson's a crusader, then certainly yeah. Reggie is. And, and therefore she could grow up. I could, I could give her that. And you give her a, a so we have Reggie and Ronnie, mm -hmm. and the two of them are hilarious. Dub there, so they're both cops, but of course, everyone makes all the jokes throughout the book, and they're hilarious, double act. Would you ever spin them off into their own? I have been asked that. Um, I told you some of these questions wouldn't be original. <laughs> well, well um, uh, Reggie's in, in, in The Next Jackson, but I couldn't quite, I felt that Ronnie needed to go off for a bit. I think she, she joins the Met. Not that people live outside books at all, I don't believe in that, but <laughs> I think she's, she's sort of doing that at the moment. Well, I remember you telling one interviewer, they said, what happened to so-and-so, and you said, I don't know, I didn't write. No, no, well, that's, that's honestly how I, I think. I don't, you know, I don't know what they're doing when they're not under my control. I dislike all those, you know, what happened to Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy and all of that. And, well, it's not the object of that. I just think that, you know, when Hamlet ends, Hamlet ends. That's it. You know, well, they're all dead. And they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. People like to think of characters doing things in, in your absence, which is fine. They can do what yeah. they want. Well, that's what fan fiction's for. Yeah, yeah. But people also, they sort of want you to be all, I mean, you've said this before, they want you to be all warm and fuzzy about your characters, and I don't think you really are. No, because you are using them for your own ends, you know. So, I mean, I do have a lot of affection for certain characters, but even then, they're not, yeah. you know, and... And I, and, and I do often think, what would Gloria do? She is my touchstone for righteous behavior. But I think, you know, you, if you start to get too close to your characters, there's a certain madness lies there, I think, because you are a writer and you're, you're making this world and you're forming this world and you are absolutely in control. The great thing about being a writer is that you can be in complete and absolute control. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a job for people who like control, I think. So you... you you get to be God because you create and destroy and there's not many areas where you can do that. And yeah, and it's a safe way to get out any aggression or frustration or anger. Well, Put it on the page. Uh, in a way, but you should always be very wary of making characters a mouthpiece for your own thoughts and beliefs. That has to be left to other people to judge. I but think. isn't Brody a little bit... I mean, you, you have said he's really a woman and he's, he's your vehicle. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he has certain, there's certain things he believes in things that I believe and think, but that doesn't make him less there. I mean, you know, it's, I, mainly I just wanted someone who came from Yorkshire to... Fair enough. And he's incredibly patriotic about Yorkshire, so... Uh, but I, I think, I think he channels my northernness. I mean, mm -hmm. he comes from a mining family, I come from a mining family. He's got that sense of, of slightly, you know, badly done by us, I think. And he has a horrible background anyway, which I don't have nearly as tragic a background as he does. No, I mean, you've given him every... Everything that everything could happen. That everything that could happen, you know. yeah, yeah. And, and many, many near-death experiences, which I think are catalogued in this book. Yes, yes. He's been blown up, he's been in a train accident. He's, yeah, his house has been his poor. His house has been, yeah, he's been, he's been rich, he's been robbed. Yeah, he's been shot at, he's fallen off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> He found his brother's body yeah, after his Yeah, he's been rich, he's been poor. He's yeah. yeah, I mean, everything. Yeah. There's almost no, no are there any tortures left? Nothing left, left? No, no. Is there any <laughs> evil you can do to him? Not much. I think he's going to have a, a jollier time in his next expedition, I think. He just so he won't be having cardiac arrest? Or no, he's had that. He's, he's, he's <laughs> oh, yes, of course, because yeah. he was in a coma yeah. for Reggie, all that time. Reggie saved his life, yeah. yeah of course, of course. Yeah. Silly me, he's been there, done that. <laughs> Um, one of the crimes, 
at the heart of the book is the Human Trafficking League. Um, and you know, that part of the world, we obviously think immediately of Jimmy Savile and men like him. But you say something in the book that I really love. You have Brody thinking, it was funny how so many men were defined by their downfall. Caesar, Fred Goodwin, Trotsky, Harvey Weinstein, Jimmy Savile, women, hardly ever. They didn't fall down, they stood up. And my comment was, yeah, we have to. It was a list that I had to stop myself adding to every week, actually, <laughs> and could still be adding to. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's true, I think. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, but it, it makes me, it, because you've mentioned Gloria a few times, it makes me think about how women do just get tougher, don't they? I think, well, you, as you said, I think they have to. I think it's... Uh, I do write from a woman's point of view, so therefore I'm kind of on the side of women, but this is not an anti, you know, this yeah. is, I, I feel very much that I don't want to come across as being in any way an, against men. Um, but I think because, um, because so many of these characters are women who are having a bad time and you have to be tough. Uh, and, and that's interesting because, uh, you know, you can project a lot onto that, I think, which, is, uh, which I enjoy. Yeah. I like all these badass women, you know, they're, they're interesting to write. And, and, and I understand women in a way that I don't understand men. So, so that's why Jackson ends up being partly a woman, just because I can, I can see that better, I yeah. think. You know, it was very difficult to choose uh, right at the beginning to have a male character, because I was going to make him into a female detective. And then I thought, well, in a way, I wanted to work with something I wasn't comfortable with. And so, you know, but he is all about his watch and his car and his... his his stuff, mm. rather than you know really ever getting into the heart of, of what makes a man, I think. Because I don't think I will ever know that. Mm. Interesting. Um, is, is part of, <coughs> because you're, you play with questions of identity so much in so many of your books, is part of being a writer, is, is it wanting to see around the back of someone and see what they're, what they're really made of? Is, that, is it that curiosity that makes you create a character? Well, I think maybe just looking into what it's like to be that character, which I suppose is the same thing. So that's why I'm always writing from inside of the head. So, you know, you, tr you want to find something sympathetic, even in the worst character. It's not sympathetic, but something that you can then portray. You don't want to just have pure evil. I mean, I suppose there's a couple of characters in this book that are pure evil, but even the really bad ones, you're looking for a way into that headspace to see what, what it is, because, you know, I mean, they're not real. Obviously, they're not real. You're making these people. So they're always ciphers for something else. But it is, you, you know, every writer is always writing about human nature, aren't they? I mean, because yeah. there isn't anything else to write about. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. So another thing, and I obviously I read all your reviews. I don't know if you, are you You've read, read everything. Well, I, do my, I try to do my homework <laughs> a little you do, bit. You do very thorough homework. Um, really. But so one of the things I really another thing because obviously I'm loving these books is um, is the way that Jack's everyone in the books is always saying, well, if, if I was Hercule Poirot or if I was Miss Marple, I'd have done this. But I'm Jackson Brody, so I'm going to do that. And again, I love the superimposition of thinking about the genre and thinking about how the genre works and then, but, but commenting on it the whole time, like doing a running sideline thing. So this is, you know, if we look at this as a crime novel, then this should be happening. But let's go over here, let's do this. I didn't really intend to do that as much as I realized I have done now. It was more because Jackson was becoming an Agatha Christie aficionado in order to have another book in the future, which was to do with Agatha Christie. So I think it was, I was just very conscious of, uh, of that. I mean, of course, obviously, I'm very conscious of the crime novel structure, which I know I'm not adhering to, really, mm. uh, which is always a slight worry in a way. But I think it just... Why is it a worry? Well, because they're called crime novels, and if you read a lot of crime novels, you expect to be taken from A to B in yeah. a very satisfactory way. I, mean, you know, I like crime novels. And these are much more meandering, and they're about character rather than yeah. the crimes themselves. The crimes themselves tend to be off stage almost always. I don't think anyone actively gets killed 
in any of these books, or maybe I've just forgotten. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, there is that. I don't want to. I don't. Yeah. Spoilers. I, there, oh no, no. There's you that see, last. The la yes. That rather bloody scene. There's blood. In oh. the in the silver thingamajig. See, I can't remember the name. Of oh, I was thinking of the swimming pool. Oh yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's a particularly satisfying one. That's a particularly one. satisfying to write. I was looking forward. <laughs> I was looking forward to writing that scene for about half the last half of the book because I knew exactly what was going to happen, and I was thinking, yes, yes, so we, we get to that point. We know we're so you home wouldn't and go jump ahead and write it. No, never, never. You never. just write no, it from no, start no, to no, finish. No, 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 I'm very puritanical at heart. You know, you don't get the pleasure of the scene you look, the scenes you look forward to, or that you know are like good and meaty and juicy or whatever. No, no. No, no, you've got to go through all the more tedious bits to get to that. You've talked about that Agatha Christie novel. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the novel years? I seem to have been writing for what, years. What's, what's, gonna, what's going <laughs> well, on? Well, I've written there? the first, uh, third, no, maybe that's very optimistic, maybe the first 20,000 words of it. And well, I had the first 10,000 words of it, and then I wrote another 10, and then I've sort of parked it um, because I don't quite feel ready to push on with it. Yeah. Um, so it will get written within the next two years. And what makes it Christie-ish? What's um, the Christie element? It's called Death at the Sign of the Rook, and it's about people, including Jackson, who are stuck in a country house hotel in the snow during a murder mystery weekend. <laughs> that is what makes it <laughs> Christie-ish. <laughs> wow. Excellent. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. That's That's... Grand. You also <laughs> once you once told David Robinson you might send Jackson to Paris or to America. No, Paris. He's, he's, he still has a possibility of going to Paris. Mm. But not he sold his house. Not as it, not as imminent as it was. Yeah. 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 Okay. I want to um, move off specifically and just ask you more generally um, about the creative power of boredom. Boredom. I boredom is. I'm an only child who grew up in the 50s, there was so much boredom, so much boredom. The only thing you had was books or watch with mother, which I love to this day. Ragtag and bobtail remain, why? Um, and so you have to use your imagination a lot. I did lots of imaginative play with you know, my dolls and my teddy. We, we did all sorts of things that were just imaginary. Um, and I, I went to, both my schools were quite a long way from my house, so I didn't have school friends living nearby. Mm -hmm. So I had to make do with like the two children who lived on my street. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time on my own. And I think children nowadays don't do that. No, no they have all. screens and they, they have, have constant screens stimulation. And they, and they have sleepovers and you know play dates and um, they're always with other people they're always or they've got the screen so they don't have it's not even you know oh can you just sit and read a book it's not that it's just that they're bombarded all the time so there's no space for just doing nothing and I think mm. doing nothing is really important I like the phrase creative indolence Mm. You know, I am I am thinking. No, no, no. I just I have to justify myself sometimes. You know, I may look as if I'm doing nothing, but this I'm is I'm always part thinking. Part of the process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and th it's a great excuse because you know who's going to tell whether you're thinking or not. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't it Gertrude Stein who said a writer's writing all the time, true. even if they're not? It's true. It's true. It is true. Yeah. Even if something happens, it's like, oh, how will I tell this to no, my no, friends later? Is, or but everything goes in all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm really quite surprised sometimes how just something that will have happened yesterday will get into the book I'm writing today, even though it appears to have nothing to do with it. So it's a constant. You're just taking in things all the time. So people are always like, oh, is that character based on someone? And uh, Not at all. I never base characters on people, but things, stuff, things yeah. that happen, they go in all the time yeah. in, in a sort of disguise. Well, yeah, and even if you're writing historically, emotions are of no era. Mm. Emotions are their emotions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't change. Yeah. You know, people remain people through centuries. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know that that you bubble. You're just full of ideas and titles all the time. That you've got. You could sell them. You know, on the m my <sighs> ideal job: hotel inspector first, and then title provider. 
Oh, I would hate to be a hotel inspector. All the <laughs> grottiness, all the eat off. I really? was born to be a hotel inspector. <laughs> What, are, what would be the best possible hotel? Well, I possibly haven't stayed in that yet, so I don't know. I think it's, it's not looking for the best possible, it's looking for how people can improve things. That's, what's, that's what that job Playing is Playing God again. Mm, yeah. Sort of a helpful Angel Michael or something. I think it just, <laughs> just that sense that you, know, you can see something and you know it can be improved and therefore everyone's lives will be better. I like that. I, I do, do that when I go into people's houses. I'm uh. like, I'd move that wall, <laughs> that color. Um, mm. I'm sure they do it in mine as well, so it's, it's completely fair. Um, but how do you know when this bubbling idea is worth pursuing? How do you know when it is a story? I d I, that is, is a good question. Um, and sometimes it will be a story because it just can't encompass a novel. Yeah, yeah. So that is a useful way of shunting something off that's yeah. an idea you don't want to lose. Or I, I find it quite difficult, actually, because at the moment I'm sort of lying fallow um, and uh, is that the thunder how exciting oh we may have to be evacuated um, that's for lightning not for thunder oh okay okay we as Edinburgh residents know we hardly ever get thunderstorms so it's very exciting to have them um, I'm d I've done a couple of story commissions over the summer but I've chosen not to write because I have two books out this year it's like it's a bit much and so I'm contemplating s in the autumn starting a new book, apart from the Jackson that's got his 20,000 words ready. And uh, the more I think about it, the more difficult it becomes because you're, I'm constantly jettisoning ideas or thinking, but that's two books or that's not that book. Or this. So trying to get into that position where you're in the starting blocks and you're actually ready to start is quite tricky because you, what I've, what one thing I've learned, if I have learned anything, is don't start before you're ready because then you're trailing all these ideas that don't fit together. So you have to have quite a clear vision of where you want to be at the end. And what this is, not what it's about, because I hate that, what's this book about? I don't know, it's, it's about itself. So, but it's like how it feels to you and, and how you feel you want to proceed with it. And so I've been going through that process because I realized I was thinking about a book that was really two books, and now I'm beginning to worry it's really three books. So it's, it's focusing on what it's about and then really thinking, do I want to write this? Is this actually doing something for me? Do I feel something? Do I feel that emotional, more than intellectual <laughs> engagement with this that will, make, well, that will get me through, that will pull me through? Because if you don't have that, it's a slog. You know, you have to have that kind of swimming pool scene at the end where you think, yeah, that's where I am. And with this book, I always had the final scene, which isn't the swimming pool scene. That was always the final scene. And I knew that that was like a little beacon of hope that was, yeah. I'm going there. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the interplay of light and dark. And, and I know somebody else asked you this, and I know it, your answers because these are books of, with serious things happening in them, but they're very, very funny. And what you had said was, well, just look at Shakespeare. It's Did I? That was a good answer. It's a brilliant answer. <laughs> no, you know, remember you said, saying that. You know, you've got <laughs> Lear and you've also got the fool and you've yeah, got, yeah, you know. Yeah. But I, I was wondering, do you prefer writing one or the other? I can't do one without the other. This too, I have learned. I, I, I can't maintain one tone or the other, so I can't write a funny, funny novel, and I can't write something intensely serious, because that's not how it works in my brain. It's got to have a kind of a modulation. It, the modulation comes naturally. It's not like I'm thinking, oh, this is terrible, I must lighten this up. I must have, you know, the porter at the gate. No, it's, it's much more than it just, it's an, it's an, it evolves, but I don't, think about it that much, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, this p book particularly is one of extremes, extremely horrible and extremely funny, and, and that is a difficult balance, but I was doing it organically and naturally. I wasn't thinking, oh, I've got to lighten this, or, or I can't have that being funny because that's so awful. It was because it's character-based, and this is how characters work. This is yeah. how people work, I think. The other was thing that the answer I gave before? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, yeah. on a, you were on about Shakespeare. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, the criminals don't have 
not only do they, you know, obviously they're, they're criminals, and, but I don't want to give anything away, but obviously the crime is, you know, Jackson's on the scene, but they don't seem to really enjoy being criminals. I think it's, um, no, no, they don't, do they? They, um, they find it quite... You know, the one guy is like hiding his money yeah. and doesn't know what to do with it, and they just don't seem to really be getting much joy out of... No joy in it, no, there's no joy in it. Out of them. their ill-gotten gain. Apart from the one who's like the top one, what's his name, Stephen, Stephen Mellis, I think he enjoys it because he's not a nice person. Um, but I think they find it taxing, actually, to, to, to sustain what they're doing. So the money, in a way, has ceased to give... The, the, the reward should have been the money, and the money no longer... They're not even spending the money. Well, I love the... Um, now you've got me doing it. It's Tommy. Tommy, Who, who yes. buys his wife top of the line. Oh, that's... That's... that's um, no, sorry. That's... <laughs> One of the characters yeah. <laughs> buys his wife top Chanel, all the top of the line handbags, but always tells her they're fakes. <laughs> so she can't even have the pleasure of saying, yeah, I have a real, you know. Oh, but I don't think she wants that pleasure also. And there's great resale value in Chanel bags, so. Yeah, in a way, it's an investment, I think. Yeah. What was he called? I don't know. Andy, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Shameful, isn't I it? I should have brought in a, a <laughs> list of characters. It's really, I'm so sorry. Tommy, uh, Tommy's Crystal. Tommy, Andy. And Vince. And uh, Steve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we remember Jackson. Jackson we can hang on to, yes. Yeah, so we yeah. can hang on to that one. And just quickly, before I ask the audience to pitch in now, what about Louise? Oh. Ooh, that that made people gasp. I don't know if that was a good gasp or a bad gasp. She does reappear at the end of yeah, this book, yeah. but she's only on the phone. Yes. And um, too much of a commitment, I think. Just wonder if she might she's, yeah, I reassert really, herself. She's really, really liked Louise as a character, uh, yeah. but I've not been able to bring her out of that book that she was in, which was When Will There Be Good News? And I just don't seem to be able to, but, she is now working in Yorkshire, and Death at the Sign of the Rook is set in Yorkshire, so Ooh, it's possibly. Possible. And she might be Reggie's boss. Well, that would be interesting. It would, wouldn't it? If only I could write that. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to make a note? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I've not written her off. I just find her incredibly difficult to bring back to life. Fair enough. Mm. I won't pressure you. Thanks. We have, f I think, four roving mics, and we have wow, four. just about 10 minutes left. Now, just remember, if you don't get a chance to ask your question in here, when you buy your book and get it signed, <laughs> I'm sure you could ask Kate the question there. And also, just bear in mind, I'm getting older. I'll do my best to see everyone. Oh, oh excellent. That helps. I'm it doesn't help me getting older, but... It so, okay, there's a question there. We'll start there. Hi, Kate. Um, there are dogs featuring uh, quite prominently, especially in the Jackson Brody novels, and I just wondered what dogs give you, oh, wow, what dogs give you and uh, allow the characters That's to build to express. I really, really love dogs. And I don't have a dog, so they all go into my books. You were going to get one. I still am, but not imminently. Um, I, think, I think if you have a dog, you know what an important part of your life it is. But I think a lot in fiction, they're, they're disregarded. You know, and I think, I think it's nice to give a dog a part in a book just because, you know, they are... You know, if you have a dog, it is a really big part of your life. So, um, unless you're a particularly bad dog owner. So I think it's, you know, they need a, to me, you know, give them, a, give them a part, really. Terrible to kill one in a book. You're not allowed because you get the letters. No, I, I, I have killed dogs in books. It's just awful. And did you get the letters? No. no. I no. bet, I bet uh, your publishers have them in a bag. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate, I'm very interested as a 
criminal practitioner oh. in how um, an author manages to immerse herself in the um, underworld of the kind of crimes that you write about. What sort of research? So when you, when you say criminal practitioner, I take it you're not a criminal. Yeah, that's, I, I'm glad you asked, because I'm, that's what <laughs> it going, sounds I'm like. going to exercise my right to remain silent. Oh, okay. oh. Um, interesting. I think um, a lot through my imagination, to be honest, and then whatever that you read now, because those books are contemporary as opposed to historical novels, so it's what is going on and what you're reading in the, in the news and seeing in the news. I know a couple of people, and I shall retain my um, right to silence on that, so that... Um, oh, this is very dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> I feel we should give it its due. <laughs> Wow. It's severe. It's severe. <laughs> so it's, it is, it's a big combination of things all coming together, basically. <laughs> is there another question? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry for the interruption. Um, we've been warned that there's lightning in the area, and so for safety reasons, we're going to have to very regretfully turn the power off in all the theatres to avoid any threat of lightning in the site. So very shortly, the lights are going to go down. So if you have a mobile phone with a torch on it, you may wish to prepare it just now. But just to be very clear, it's safe to stay inside this theatre, safer to stay here in the dry than to go outside. Once the, once the lighting has gone, then that takes away any...